Welcome to This Week in Missouri Politics. After one of the longest weeks in the history of the Missouri General Assembly, we're joined by the first time on our show, very glad to have you, the State Auditor of Missouri, Nicole Galloway. Welcome to This Week in Missouri Politics. Yeah, thank you for having me. Everyone watching this has to be blurry-eyed and dreading in one more week before spring break. But you've came in and we're about, I guess, we're almost a year into your term as auditor. Mm -hmm. How are you liking the job? It's fantastic. It is such an honor to serve as state auditor, uh, really representing the point of view of taxpayers and citizens and government, holding government accountable at all levels on behalf of taxpayers. So I guess that uh, you might never have expected to become auditor in the way you became. Sure. So you've taken the job without the, some of the training you'd had if you decided to run for it and prepared. What's some of the things that surprised you about the job that you wouldn't have thought? You know, certainly I am uh, sensitive to the circumstances that brought me into this position. And, uh, you know, I think Auditor Schweik was a true public servant who mm -hmm. believed in what he did and uh, served Missouri taxpayers very well. You know, I'm a CPA and a certified fraud examiner. And I think what surprises me uh, the most is when we catch people committing fraud and they think they're going to get away with it. Um, you know, we've had conflicts of interest. We've had officials that have had to resign. We have had attorney general uh, press charges or uh, file lawsuits to get money that was that, that taxpayers were uh, defrauded out of back. And so I think in this role, I'm surprised uh, when we find that fraud and, uh, you know, those folks thought that they could get away with it. <laughs> so uh, what a week in the state Senate. Um, members of your party, the Democrat caucus is down to, you know, very limited numbers, but they held the floor for 40 hours in opposed to HJR 39, which would put on the ballot a constitutional amendment. The Republicans say it protects religious freedoms of bakers and florists and clergy. The Democrats' argument was it singles out L the LG LGBT community to be treated um, unfairly in, in marriage ceremonies. Uh, where do you come down on the debate? I'm proud of the Senate Democrats standing up against discrimination. And look, I have worked in the private sector. Uh, you know, I, I worked in the public se our private sector for many years before uh, becoming an elected official. And I understand why chambers of commerce across the state do not support this measure. An important part of that debate, wasn't it, that the business community you would have thought, I think, going in would have been on one side of it, but they weren't. They were very much opposed to the, they were opposed to the bill. I guess very much maybe overstating it. They were opposed, uh, they were both of this going on the ballot and becoming law. That surprised you? It does not, because we want to attract and retain a skilled workforce, a trained workforce, an educated workforce, and we don't need to put up barriers of discrimination uh, to, to do that. We need to break those barriers of discrimination down. So it is not surprising to me that the business community does not support this bill. My assumption is this goes through the House rather quickly and goes on the ballot. Um, I think most folks would say it's likely to pass, semi-likely to pass at the ballot. but. Looking forward, I mean, I think a lot of folks have sympathy for especially the clergy, but also some florists that may not want to do something that's against their beliefs. The overall point, though, I mean, every day in Missouri, someone turns 18 and registers to vote that likely doesn't care about who's gay or who's straight. Every day, someone who might not have those type of evolved opinions on the LBGD community dies. Your party seems to be in the right spot on history here. You know, I think when people understand what this bill does and the opportunities for discrimination it causes, that it will not have the broad support that it's assumed to have. Do you think the difference might be, though, that there's not a Missouri pro case where a photographer's been sued for not taking pictures of a gay wedding? Do you think if there was a case of this happening in Missouri, this debate might change fundamentally? I think that's possible. And I, you know, I think that there's discrimination that happens in many different levels and for different reasons uh, every day. And we need to break down those barriers of discrimination and not accept those. We cannot have a culture where we accept discrimination and promote that or enshrine that into law and expect, uh, you know, skilled workers, trained workers to want to stay here in this state. Let's talk, speaking of barriers, let's talk about some barriers the government puts up that you're trying to break down in municipal courts. Is it not been the most insane, unspoken problem that these courts have been abusing their citizens for this long and no one has stepped up to point it out? And, and look, what, how is your work in auditing these courts trying to bring them to justice? 
So as state auditor, it's my job to hold all levels of government accountable, whether it's large state agencies or municipal governments and municipal courts. And the auditor's office is the only independent mechanism to hold these local governments accountable and these municipal courts accountable to following the law and serving their citizens. So let me give you a couple examples of some of, of, of some of the things that we have found in our audits. Uh, we have found in Forestell, for instance, that there were improper fees and fines collected on citizens. In St. Anne, here in St. Louis, uh, we found over $38,000 in improper fees collected from citizens. And that's money these citizens are never going to get back. Um, and you know, because of our audits, you know, we, we can't recapture that money for those citizens, but because of the audits, they're not doing that moving forward and they have corrected that. But I do want to point out that while the, the microscope is on St. Louis right now for the municipal court issue, this is a statewide issue. Oh, yeah. We find in, uh, in municipal courts across the state these similar issues. And uh, for instance, in Joplin, there was uh, our audit found that over $145,000 of improper fees were collected if, if and assessed on citizens. There's a mayor somewhere this week, and they're thinking about how they can bilk their citizens for more money. Do they know, will you stay on this when the cameras are off, when this issue fades, as they all do? Will you stay on this? Yes, we routinely audit municipal courts, and we have expanded our procedures, the audit procedures that we do in municipal courts, because I think that sometimes we have a total mistrust of government, right? We think you that, <laughs> you know, we have a mistrust of government, and uh, when you uh, charge improper fees, we found a clerk down in southwest Missouri that stole over $65,000 worth of funds from her local court. When you have those instances, we know that there's an issue there, and that, that feeds into that mistrust. Through the audit process, where we hold these governments accountable, require them to be transparent, then hopefully we can get to a more healthy skepticism of these, of these courts. Speaking of that fraud, touch on, you've made cybersecurity an issue. Touch on what you're doing on that. So you can turn on the news uh, and you'll hear about breaches in Target, um, Anthem, that Sony. affected one in three Missourians. Yeah. I mean, it's not just a, it's not just a private sector issue. It's a public sector issue as well. Um, you know, we think about the IRS. And so when in government, when we have personal information, we have to proactively protect it to make sure it doesn't fall in the wrong hands. And let me give you an example of an audit that we did last year. We audited the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And we found that uh, that state agency was collecting transmitting and maintaining student social security numbers that they did not need for business purpose. They didn't need those social security numbers. And because of our audit, they have stopped the collection when they don't need it, and they have securely destroyed the social security numbers that they don't need anymore. And so when we look at this at a broad state agency level, we started to think, okay, what does this mean at the local level as sure. well? And so we've initiated uh, audits in our five school districts across the state to say, how are they proactive protecting student information, hmm. family information, faculty and staff information. Well, seeing if they don't need it at all, right? Right, absolutely. I think, you know, we these are risks that maybe didn't exist 30 years ago, but exist now, exist in this century. And some of these practices were put in place decades ago. And we need to ask the question and reevaluate, do the we need that The last question I want to ask you, though, is presidential primaries this week. Who are you voting for? <laughs> so, you know, as a, as a woman and as a mother, um, I support a candidate who is going to support middle-class families, break down barriers, and I think that person is Clinton because Trump, the standard bearer of the Republican Party right now, is putting up those barriers of discrimination, and I don't feel comfortable with that. You know, I have uh, two young sons, and I think about their future a lot, but I also have young nieces, I have friends with young daughters, and I want them to succeed, and they don't, I don't want them to have to face additional barriers of discrimination to get that to that evil uh, playing field. Senator Nicole Galloway, thank you so much for joining us on this week in Missouri Politics, and we hope we'll have you back. Yeah, thank you very much. I, it was great. We're going to be back right back with our special presidential primary opinion maker panel. But first, we'll leave you with this week's leading Missouri economic indicators.
All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Welcome back to our very special Republican presidential primary opinion maker panel. Joined this week by the first time on the show, Chris Arps, big Ted Cruz supporter, right? Big Cruz supporter. Welcome this week in Missouri Thank politics. Thank you. Real honor. Old friend of the show, Aaron Miller. And if there's anybody I would have thought would have supported the most intelligent, thoughtful candidate, John Kasich, it would be Aaron Willard. I agree. The chief of staff is one of the last Republican state senators, right? <laughs> Big week. And he doesn't even look tired. That's what I like. <laughs> Travis Fitzwater, he got to sit at the other end of the, uh, the Capitol this week and watch the Senate talk all day. Good to have you on. And a Rubio supporter, right? Yes, sir. And mayor of Ellisville, the man that slayed Walmart, Adam Paul, is of all people, I am not surprised to see, a Donald Trump supporter. That's Mayor right. Paul, welcome this week in Missouri Politics, and tell us why. Well, politics is a, a blood sport, and, and Donald Trump, the reason he's getting so much traction is because he's made it into a spectator sport. <clears throat> and unfortunately for the establishment, he's hit them so hard that their shoulders are touching right now. If he's our Republican <laughs> nomination, uh, it's, it's, it's really a game changer for our party. Uh, people are tired of the white noise. People are tired of the, uh, the nonsense that's spewed by a, a Republican-controlled uh, Senate and House currently. And, and you know, you don't have to look far but our own backyard. Just for instance, everyone puts campaign contribution reform on their, on their, uh, their mailers. And, 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 and if you look at a, a, the, the Senate bill that got, that got crushed this, this legislative session, uh, it was almost like a, a, a midnight pool party was stripped down so much. Uh, and and people, are, people are, quite frankly, Scott, they're, they're tired of the, uh, the white noise, the nonsense that's spewed, and, 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 and you're looking at your evangelicals and, and, and bases that would usually stick to their religious beliefs. They're voting for and supporting Donald Trump because, quite frankly, I think they'd vote for a ham sandwich before another Bush, a Rubio, or a, a Clinton. Well, Chris, Chris Arps, I am part of the poorly educated that Donald Trump loves. Okay. Tell me why I should support Ted Cruz. Well, one of the things that excites me, there's three things that excite me about Ted Cruz. One is he's a politician that's not, exp not afraid to express his faith publicly. Um, two, he's a strict uh, constitutional constructionist, and I think that's very important with a Supreme Court 
opening that we have right now. And the third thing that I like about Senator Cruz is he's not afraid to take on the leadership of his own party, and he's also not afraid to take on the special interests like he did the ethanol lobby uh, in Iowa. So it's those three things, plus I was on the campaign trail with the, the senator in Iowa and South Carolina, and I got to see him up close and see what he stands for and see the energy of the crowds. and. Uh, just made me uh, support him even more. Plus, Missouri's own Jeff Rowe running an incredible campaign, right? Excellent campaign. Very proud of him. Aaron Willard, I mean, when you watch a debate, don't most people in their hearts know John Casey will be the best president? Well, I hope so, and I hope more, more and more people are, are starting to feel that way. I mean, here's a, here's a guy, you know, in my opinion, that has worked inside and outside the system. You know, mm -hmm. he, he kind of came in and said, look, we're going to change things, balanced budget, you know, amendment for four different years, the federal level. That was the last time that's been done in any of our probably history that we can remember. Uh, he's also turned around his state. You know, I mean, this is somebody who, who came in and inherited a budget deficit of several billion dollars. He was an $8 billion deficit in his home state in, in Ohio. Turned around into a $2 billion surplus. Plus, you know, so you're, if, for, if you're a fiscal conservative and you're looking for somebody who can kind of, you know, watch the in-house, he's done it. If you also look at, hey, you know, we, we care about businesses. We want to make sure that people put more of the money that they've earned back in their pocket. A $5 billion tax cut in Ohio, the largest in the country. You know, so, I mean, this guy, I think, actually has, you know, the leadership and the experience to do it. And he's done it, you know, in a way that maybe in this election cycle isn't getting a lot of attention, but he's effective. And, and I think that people are frustrated. I would agree with Adam. You know, people are really frustrated. But I think that they're frustrated because they're not getting any results. And John Kasich is a guy who I think has actually gotten results. And so that's where I think as this, you know, goes further down. We started with 17 candidates. Now we're at four. We'll see where we are maybe after Tuesday. Um, you know, the four remaining, John Kasich makes the most sense to me. And I think when people look at him again, you know, something else is national security. I mean, it, it's hard to say that anybody else on that, on that stage has really, in my opinion, has been able to express and kind of articulate some of the, the positions on national security that John Representative Kasich has. Representative Fitzwater, though, you support Rubio. It looks to me like if you're talking about somebody that could win, Marco Rubio is the candidate that has the best chance to win, right? He could actually be president. I think a couple of things that stand out. One is that any of these four candidates are better than what we have currently and what we can have after this election if none of them get elected. But I think Marco Rubio is a generational leader. I mean, he's a, a young guy. He's worked hard. He's not an establishment guy. He came in in 2010 with the Tea Party. He's a guy that's that beat an establishment candidate mm -hmm. at that point. He's not an insider like every like some people like to mention. But he's an incredible, incredibly inspired. Inspiring. This is a this is a gentleman that's worked incredibly hard. He's got a compelling story. He, what I believe is probably the most electable candidate uh, out of the four that are still here. One that I think can take the battle to Hillary Clinton in a very compelling way, in a very uh, in inspiring way. Not to mention how optimistic he is about our country going forward. Got support of Missouri of two speakers, uh, Todd Richardson and Ron Richard. Uh, I'm a little surprised he's not doing better in Missouri. Well, I think you know that's it's a a product of what Adam Adam mentioned I think earlier is that you have you want people to speak to what's really going on right now. You want people that aren't um, that that are going to speak to the frustrations. And there are a lot of frustrations in our community. My district, it's my district um, especially. There are a lot of frustrations, and and so we've got to get down to the heart of what people are asking for, and that's to change Washington in a big way. And I think Marco Rubio does that. Uh, Chris Arps, big, big weekend for Ted Cruz. Earn the support of Congresswoman Ann Wagner. That's going to be, if there was something that would tip the race, if it is close, and I think, I don't believe the polls anymore. I've seen Bernie right. Sanders sweep right. Michigan. Uh, huge pickup with Ann Wagner, right? Ann Wagner was a huge pickup. I also think, um, you know, we got the endorsement of Senator Mike Lee, who was a big conservative uh, stalwart. Didn't that kind of stand out that no one else had supported him in the Senate? Well, I think that was, you know, I've been to a lot of rallies uh, in South Carolina and in, and in Iowa, and one of the applause lines that Senator Cruz uses is that he is not <laughs> very well liked by his colleagues in, in the Senate. So that's really an applause line for him. And I think, you know, Senator Lee is one of the more conservative members of the Senate, and with him coming out, and endorsing the senator with Ann Wagner, with Carly Fiorina. I think the momentum is really uh, rising for Senator Cruz in Missouri. Adam Paul, you have a, uh, a wife who's far more attractive and intelligent than you. That is that's, true. That <laughs> goes without saying. Is it sometimes when you talk, when Donald Trump says some things, it makes me look at my mother, sister, wife, and have a little pause. Does some of the things he says make it to where you really believe in a lot of the things he does in his style? But some of the things he says are a little hard to choke down. 
It, it is, and, and, and again, it goes back to the bringing things to the forefront. Uh, you know, strategy companies and, and campaign strategists, they like to keep things behind the scenes because they can manipulate it better. What Donald Trump does is put it into the forefront, and they can't control that. He, they like the more methodical approach, and, and I could do without Donald Trump's uh, political kabuki theater. And, and the entire GOP's uh, uh, card this year, I could, I could do without some of the, the name-calling and, and the petulant behavior. I get it, and I kind of like it. But at the end of the day, it is now a spectator sport and 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 they are they are um, they are here to win they're not here to lose and and I believe um, you know with the rally that Trump had here in the weekend you saw diversity you saw young folks that came came out and, and 30,000 people wanted tickets to go to that event and that that goes to show uh, you know th there's gonna be a major shakeup before it's all said and done and in, in, in the Republican Party we're tired of country club Republicans and the talking heads he owns a country club well I know it. <laughs> when, yeah, you, at least he owns the country club there but, you go. but you know the country club Republicans and the talking heads maybe he's decisions. a Rodney Dangerville from Caddyshack guy at the country club yeah maybe he, he, is. he one thing he does is he, uh, he he's he's very unpolished uh, for, for, from a political standpoint uh, I, I think he'll get better. Sell? Yeah, it sells because, you know, there is an entertainment value Aaron, about though, it. But If all the other three candidates had a rally in St. Louis, they couldn't get 30,000 people to want to come. Uh, is there not something to be said for the fact that ca he can bring new people into the party? And can you imagine him taking on Hillary Clinton? Yeah, you know, I think that there there have been huge crowds, and that's true. I mean, he's also had the advantage of having several television shows and, and millions and millions of dollars that, you know, he, he's mm -hmm. kind of a different persona outside of politics. So, I, you know, I can kind of understand that. Um, but I think, you know, the other thing that when you say it's a contact sport, I get that. But at the end of the day, this isn't a game where we look at the scoreboard. This is the future of our country, and that, to me, is what really is the most concerning. And I think that, you know, you're right. I mean, it, it brings people in. That's great. We've seen record turnouts in a lot of these states. That's really energizing for the party. That's something that the party needs to work, you know, on itself. And we've got to figure out, I mean, how, to, how do we recast that? How do we bring people out? How do we bring that energy? But at the end of the day, we saw what happened when somebody who wasn't tested, who was really popular, and they came in and they won, and we got eight years of Barack Obama. Yeah. And all of us up here are incredibly frustrated with that. You know, he hasn't had the experience. Experience. You know, it took in, in presidential cycles where really maybe you have 18 months to begin and then you have to start thinking about your reelection already. He didn't in the first 18 months even understand what his job was. That's why I think John Kasich is such a great leader is because this is somebody who has executive experience who can come in on day one and understand that. He can do that. And then he's and then we're moving on. We're, get, we're getting further down the road with our country. And I think that's where all of us want to be is we want to get to a better place than we are now because we all believe we can. Travis, you uh, ran for office. Your first election was against a former incumbent House member who is very well known in the district. And she's a, a, a female Democratic politician that was very effective in Gracia Backer. You won by a large margin. What could you look at as whether you're Donald Trump or Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio, or John Kasich? How would you advise him to start taking that fight on? I think the ground game is incredibly significant, and that's where some of these campaigns, I think, really stand out. You see maybe Ted Cruz, who may not yeah. do near as well uh, in some areas, but the ground game and the strategy behind what they're doing is, is really impressive. And so I think ground game goes a long way that people maybe, maybe don't look at. Um, so I think it's, it's hard work, it's knocking doors, it's making sure you see the people you need to see, it's having rallies and getting in front. It's inspiring with a message that gives hope and optimism going forward. But I think the strategy has to be solid. The strategy has to be really solid. And I think that's where um, some of the candidates stand out and some others are, are maybe struggling. Chris Hobbs, doesn't Donald Trump take a street fight to Hillary Clinton and she's never been in one? Uh, yeah, I do. But, you know, I, I kind of subscribe to the, to the theory that kind of Bill Clinton and the Clintons and, the, and, uh, and Trump are kind of in cahoots. I mean, they've... You know, they've gone to each other's weddings. But you know, they've, th this just seems all of a sudden that the last couple of years, you know, Donald Trump is espousing all of these liberal viewpoints, and then all of a sudden um, he's conservative. Just don't you think Donald kind Trump, of raises up antennas don't you think for me Donald just Trump's a little bit. Campaign planning against Hillary Clinton might be to email her and say, I'm coming. <laughs> I'm coming for you. Yeah. Or, or, I've, or, I've, done, or I've, I've cleared the field for you, and you're going to be the next president. Can I have good tickets to the inauguration? I wouldn't, if I was Hillary Clinton, and I believe Donald Trump would not take the presidency for me, she's too naive. Be president, <laughs> Adam. I mean, can what what was what does a Trump do every day with the world media attention 
attacking Hillary Clinton. He, 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 Trump gobbles up the media attention. And, and that, that's part Trump. of it. That, look, he's yeah. a businessman. Donald Trump's a businessman. He's, he's an expert at corporate level, business level, and functional level strategy. His strategies are working right now, and that is to get the Republican nomination. All focus will be, will be uh, forwarded onto Hillary Clinton so, after, after the GOP nomination. So this made. is, as a person that's, that's, that's covered Trump favorably, um, I don't believe Donald Trump really cares about abortion. I don't believe Donald Trump is an enemy of equality in the LBGT community. I don't believe Donald Trump cares a lot about guns. Do you think that he is a dangerous general election candidate? Because after this nomination's over, he flips the switch. I, I do, and, and, and again, I think that that, that uh, carries my point regarding Donald Trump. Um, he's he's bringing in voters, evangelical voters, had voted religious beliefs he for calls years. He the evangelicals too. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's and you know people are like I said, people are tired of the the same old same old political rhetoric that people are going to you know under promise or over promise and under deliver. And what Trump does is is, is he resets the clock and, and brings the base of the Republican Party to align what what the people's beliefs are, and 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 and, and that's what he's doing. Whether you agree with seven. 70% of Donald Trump, and you don't disagree with 30% that he likes, people are willing to take that risk. Chris, how does Ted Cruz win? Ted Cruz wins by just doing what he's, what he's already been doing, um, giving out his values about being a strict constructionist, um, talking about the importance of who we put on the next Supreme Court, and just showing that he has ideas and that he has solutions. I mean, I think one thing that we're seeing now that the debate field is down to four people is... You know, Donald Trump doesn't have a lot of substance when he talks about what he's going to do. He just says, just trust me, believe <laughs> me, it's huge. And one thing that I do applaud Kasich is Kasich is detailed on his policies and what he wants sure. to do. That's the same thing that uh, that Senator Cruz is doing. Travis, it's sort of the Missouri Times that never lets you get away with saying, we're going to build the Rams a stadium and make Illinois pay for it. <laughs> Isn't that not frustrating? It's got to be frustrating. Well, let's, I mean, let's not talk about that. I think going back to Rubio, I think he's got to win Florida. we got to win Florida, Ohio. Those are important Does he win Florida? the puzzle. I think he's got a great Do chance. Do you believe the, that if he wins Florida, there's a path for him to get the nomination? I think there has to be. And that's he why he's a in. a brokered convention, that's, I guess. That's why he's in. Does John Kasich, is he the last one that could really start something if he wins his home state? I think absolutely. I mean, he, he's going to come into Ohio. The last poll we'd seen is that he's actually, he's, he's been trending up. Now he's ahead of Trump in his, in his home state in Ohio. You know, they're going to have about halfway through the delegate count, I think, after Super Tuesday. After that, if John Kasich wins Ohio, you're looking at a very different map where it's upper Midwestern states. Uh, he's going to do well there. There's also going to be some more states on the, east, uh, on the eastern coast. And then you've got California. He's got, he's got Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger's endorsement. I think that, you know, there's 172 delegates sitting out there in California. If John Kasich stays in this, he wins Ohio, he stays in the long run, he's going to be a contender. Last minute predictions. Does Donald Trump win Missouri, Adam Paul? Yes. Christopher Ross, does Ted Cruz win Missouri? Yes, he does. Double down. If Ted Cruz is the Republican nominee, does Ann Wagner look like a great vice presidential candidate? Uh, I don't know. Ann Wagner's in leadership in Congress, so she may want to be stay nice. in and be move a, up. It'd be very nice to offset some of his hard It would. It would. Travis Fitzwater, does Marco Rubio stay in this race of the convention? I think he's got to win Tuesday. He's got to win if, Florida on Tuesday. If he does not, is he the governor of Florida and the nominee in 2020 if Hillary Clinton? Uh, I president? think it's a good option, for sure. Uh, does John Kasich, does he, does he, if he wins Ohio, give me the percentages on if he can pull through and be the nominee. Uh, I think that, you know, he's, there's going to be a path. I still think there's going to be a path. I mean, he'll come through Ohio, chance. he'll win it. If he wins Ohio, he, can, he could stay in and win a broker convention. Yeah, I Last think. Last prediction, would he be Donald Trump's vice president? <laughs> He says no. He's, I mean, he's got a great job now. He's the governor of Ohio. So Tough. I <laughs> want to thank everybody for being here. Tuesday, big Republican and Democratic presidential primaries in the state of Missouri. Watch MissouriTimes.com. We'll be covering it in real time live all Tuesday evening. And we'll see you back here next week on This Week in Missouri Politics. This Week in Missouri Politics brought to you in part by Sterling Bank.